Chapter 47 of Ten Years Later. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eden Rayhedrick. Ten Years Later by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 47 The Orderly Clerk. The King, anxious to be quite alone, in order to reflect well upon what was passing in his heart, had withdrawn to his own apartments, where Monsieur de saint aignan had, after his conversation with Madame, gone to meet him. This conversation has already been related. The favourite, vain of his twofold importance, and feeling that he had become, during the last two hours, the confidant of the king, began to treat the affairs of the court in a somewhat indifferent manner, and, from the position in which he had placed himself, or rather, where chance had placed him, he saw nothing but a love and garlands of flowers around him. The king's love for Madame, that of Madame for the king, that of Guiche for Madame, that of La Vallière for the king, that of Malicorne for Montalais, that of Mademoiselle de Tenay Charente for himself, was not all this, truly, more than enough to turn the head of any courtier? Besides, Saint-Aignan was the model of courtiers, past, present, and to come, and, moreover, showed himself such an excellent narrator, and so discerningly appreciative, that the king listened to him with an appearance of great interest, particularly when he described the excited manner with which Madame had sought for him to converse about the affair of Mademoiselle de la Vallière. While the king no longer experienced for Madame any remains of the passion he had once felt for her, there was, in this same eagerness of Madame to procure information about him, great gratification for his vanity, from which he could not free himself. He experienced this pleasure then, but nothing more, and his heart was not for a single moment alarmed at what Madame might, or might not, think of his adventure. When, however, Saint-Aignan had finished, the king, while preparing to retire to rest, asked, "'Now, Saint-Aignan, you know what Mademoiselle de la Vallière is, do you not?' "'Not only what she is, but what she will be.' "'What do you mean?' I mean that she is everything that a woman can wish to be, that is to say, beloved by your majesty. I mean that she will be everything your majesty may wish her to be. That is not what I am asking. I do not wish to know what she is today, or what she will be tomorrow. As you have remarked, that is my affair. But tell me what others say of her. They say she is well-conducted. Oh, said the king, smiling, that is mere report. But rare enough at court, sire, to believe when it is spread. Perhaps you are right. Is she well born? Excellently. The daughter of the Marquis de la Vallière, and stepdaughter of that good Monsieur de saint Remy. Ah, yes, my aunt's major-domo, I remember, and I remember now that I saw her as I passed through Blois, she was presented to the queen's. I have even to reproach myself that I did not on that occasion pay her the attention she deserved. Oh, sire, I trust that your majesty will now repair time lost. And the report, you tell me, is that Mademoiselle de la Vallière never had a lover? In any case, I do not think your majesty would be much alarmed at the rivalry. Yet stay said the king, in a very serious tone of voice. "'Your Majesty?' "'I remember.' "'Ah!' "'If she has no lover, she has, at least, a betrothed.' "'A betrothed?' "'What, Count, do you not know that?' "'No. "'You, the man who knows all the news?' "'Your Majesty will excuse me. "'You know this betrothed, then?' "'Assuredly.' His father came to ask me to sign the marriage contract. It is... The king was about to pronounce the Vicomte de Bragelonne's name when he stopped and knitted his brows. It is... repeated Saint-Aignan inquiringly. I don't remember now, replied Louis the Fourteenth, endeavouring to conceal an annoyance he had some trouble to disguise. Can I put your majesty in the way? inquired the Comte de Saint-Aignan. No, for I no longer remember to whom I intended to refer. Indeed, I only remember very indistinctly that one of the maids of honour was to marry. The name, however, has escaped me. 
was it mademoiselle de tonnay charente he was going to marry inquired saint-aignan very likely said the king in such a case the intended was monsieur de montespan but mademoiselle de tonnay charente did not speak of it it seemed to me in such a manner as would frighten suitors away at all events said the king i know nothing or almost nothing about mademoiselle de la valliere saint i rely upon you to procure me every information about her yes sire and when shall i have the honor of seeing your majesty again to give you the latest news whenever you have procured it i shall obtain it speedily then if the information can be as quickly obtained as my wish to see your majesty again well said count by the by has madame displayed any ill feeling against this poor girl none sire madame did not get angry then i do not know i only know that she laughed continually that's well but i think i hear voices in the ante-rooms no doubt a courier has just arrived inquire saint the count ran to the door and exchanged a few words with the usher he returned to the king saying sire it is monsieur fouquet who has this moment arrived by your majesty's orders he says he presented himself but because of the lateness of the hour he does not press for an audience this evening and is satisfied to have his presence formally announced monsieur fouquet i wrote to him at three o'clock inviting him to be at fontainebleau the following day and he arrives at fontainebleau at two o'clock in the morning this is indeed zeal exclaimed the king delighted to see himself so promptly obeyed on the contrary monsieur fouquet shall have his audience i summoned him and will receive him let him be introduced as for you count pursue your inquiries and be here to-morrow the king placed his finger on his lips and saint-aignan his heart brimful of happiness hastily withdrew telling the usher to introduce monsieur fouquet who thereupon entered the king's apartment louis rose to receive him good evening monsieur fouquet he said smiling graciously i congratulate you on your punctuality and yet my message must have reached you late at nine in the evening sire you have been working very hard lately monsieur fouquet for i have been informed that you have not left your room at saint man during the last three or four days it is perfectly true your majesty that i have kept myself shut up for the past three days replied fouquet do you know monsieur fouquet that i had a great many things to say to you continued the king with a most gracious air your majesty overwhelms me and since you are so graciously disposed towards me will you permit me to remind you of the promise you made to grant an audience ah yes some church dignitary who thinks he has to thank me for something is it not precisely so sire the hour is perhaps badly chosen but the time of the companion whom i have brought with me is valuable and as fontainebleau is on the way to his diocese who is it then the bishop of vaux whose appointment your majesty at my recommendation deigned three months since to sign that is very possible said the king who had signed without reading and he is here yes sir vaux is an important diocese the flock belonging to this pastor needed his religious consolation they are savages whom it is necessary to polish at the same time as he instructs them and monsieur de blay is unequalled in such kind of missions monsieur de blay said the king musingly as if his name heard long since was not however unknown to him oh said fouquet promptly your majesty is not acquainted with the obscure name of one of your most faithful and valuable servants no i confess i am not and so he wishes to set off again he has this very day received letters which will perhaps compel him to leave so that before setting off for that unknown region called bretagne he is desirous of paying his respects to your majesty is he waiting he is here sire let him enter fouquet made a sign to the usher in attendance who was waiting behind the tapestry the door opened and aramis entered the king allowed him to finish the compliments which he addressed to him and fixed a long look upon a countenance which no one could forget after having once beheld it vin he said you are the bishop of vin i believe yes sire vin is in breton i think aramis bowed near the coast aramis again bowed a few leagues from belle isle is it not yes sire replied aramis six leagues i believe six leagues a mere step then said louis the fourteenth 
"'Not for us poor Bretons, sire,' replied Aramis. Six leagues, on the contrary, is a great distance, if it be six leagues on land, and an immense distance, if it be leagues on sea. Besides, I have the honour to mention to your majesty that there are six leagues of sea from the river to Belle Isle. "'It is said that Monsieur Fouquet has a very beautiful house there,' inquired the king. "'Yes, it is said so,' replied Aramis, looking quietly at Fouquet. "'What do you mean, it is said so?' exclaimed the king. "'He has, sire.' "'Really, Monsieur Fouquet, I must confess that one circumstance surprises me.' "'What may that be, sire?' "'That you should have at the head of the diocese a man like Monsieur d'Herblay, and yet should not have shown him Belle Isle.' "'Oh, sire,' replied the bishop, without giving Fouquet time to answer, "'we poor Breton prelates seldom leave our residences.' "'Monsieur de Vin,' said the king, "'I will punish Monsieur Fouquet for his indifference.' "'In what way, sire?' "'I will change your bishopric.' Fouquet bit his lips, but Aramis only smiled. "'What income does Vin bring you?' continued the king. Sixty thousand leaves, sire,' said Aramis. "'So trifling an amount as that, but you possess other property, Monsieur de Vin?' "'I have nothing else, sire. Only Monsieur Fouquet pays me one thousand two hundred leaves a year for his pew in the church.' "'Well, Monsieur d'Herblay, I promise you something better than that.' "'Sire, I will not forget you.' Aramis bowed and the king also bowed to him in a respectful manner, as he was accustomed to do towards women and members of the church. Aramis gathered that his audience was at an end. He took his leave of the king in the simple, unpretending language of a country pastor, and disappeared. "'He is indeed a remarkable face,' said the king, following him with his eyes as long as he could see him, and even to a certain degree when he was no longer to be seen. "'Sire,' replied Fouquet, "'if that bishop had been educated early in life,' No prelate in the kingdom would deserve the highest distinctions better than he. His learning is not extensive, then? He changed the sword for the crucifix, and that rather late in life. But it matters little, if your majesty will permit me to speak of Monsieur de Vin again on another occasion. I beg you to do so. But before speaking of him, let us speak of yourself, Monsieur Fouquet. Of me, sire? Yes, I have to pay you a thousand compliments. I cannot express to your majesty the delight with which you overwhelm me. I understand you, Monsieur Fouquet. I confess, however, to have had certain prejudices against you. In that case I was indeed unhappy, sire. But they exist no longer. Did you not perceive? I did indeed, sire, but I awaited with resignation the day when the truth would prevail, and it seems that that day has now arrived. Ah, you know, then, you were in disgrace with me? Alas, sire, I perceived it. And do you know the reason? Perfectly well. Your Majesty thought that I had been wastefully lavish in expenditure. Not so. Far from that. Or rather, an indifferent administrator. In a word, you thought that, as the people had no money, there would be none for Your Majesty either. Yes, I thought so. But I was deceived. Fouquet bowed. And no disturbances? No complaints? And money enough, said Fouquet. The fact is that you have been profuse with it during the last month. I have more, not only for your majesty's requirements, but for all your caprices. I thank you, Monsieur Fouquet, replied the king seriously. I will not put you to the proof. For the next two months I do not intend to ask you for anything. I will avail myself of the interval to amass five or six millions, which will be serviceable as money in hand in case of war. Five or six millions? For the expenses of your majesty's household only, be it understood. You think war probable, Monsieur Fouquet? I think that if heaven has bestowed on the eagle a beak and claws, it is to enable him to show his royal character. The king blushed with pleasure. We have spent a great deal of money these past few days, Monsieur Fouquet. Will you not scold me for it? Sire, your majesty has still twenty years of youth to enjoy, and a thousand million francs to lavish in those twenty years. That is a great deal of money, Monsieur Fouquet, said the king. I will economize, sire. Besides, your majesty has two valuable servants in monsieur colbert and myself the one will encourage you to be prodigal with your treasures and this shall be myself if my service shall continue to be agreeable to your majesty and the other will economize money for you and this will be monsieur colbert's province monsieur colbert returned the king astonished certainly sire monsieur colbert is an excellent accountant at this commendation bestowed by the traduced on the traducer the king felt himself penetrated with confidence and admiration 
there was not moreover either in fouquet's voice or look anything which injuriously affected a single syllable of the remark he had made he did not pass one eulogium as it were in order to acquire the right of making two reproaches the king comprehended him and yielding to so much generosity and address he said you praise monsieur colbert then yes sire i praise him for besides being a man of merit i believe him to be devoted to your majesty's interests is that because he has often interfered with your own views said the king smiling exactly sire explain yourself it is simple enough i am the man who is needed to make the money come in he is the man who is needed to prevent it leaving nay nay monsieur le surintendant you will presently say something which will correct this good opinion do you mean as far as administrative abilities are concerned sire yes not in the slightest really upon my honour sire i do not know throughout france a better clerk than monsieur colbert this word clerk did not possess in sixteen sixty one the somewhat subservient significance attached to it in the present day but as spoken by fouquet whom the king had addressed as the superintendent it seemed to acquire an insignificant and petty character that at this juncture served admirably to restore fouquet to his place and colbert to his own and yet said louis the fourteenth it was colbert however that notwithstanding his economy has the arrangement of my fates here at fontainebleau and i assure you monsieur fouquet that in no way has he checked the expenditure of money fouquet bowed but did not reply is it not your opinion too said the king i think sire he replied that monsieur colbert has done what he had to do in an exceedingly orderly manner and that he deserves in this respect all the praise your majesty may bestow upon him the word orderly was a proper accompaniment for the word clerk the king possessed that extreme sensitiveness of organization that delicacy of perception which pierced through and detected the regular order of feelings and sensations before the actual sensations themselves and he therefore comprehended that the clerk had in fouquet's opinion been too full of method and order in his arrangements in other words that the magnificent fates of fontainebleau might have been rendered more magnificent still the king consequently felt that there was something in the amusements he had provided with which some person or another might be able to find fault he experienced a little of the annoyance felt by a person coming from the provinces to paris dressed out in the very best clothes which his wardrobe can furnish only to find that the fashionably dressed man there looks at him either too much or not enough this part of the conversation which fouquet had carried on with so much moderation yet with extreme tact inspired the king with the highest esteem for the character of the man and the capacity of the minister fouquet took his leave at a quarter to three in the morning and the king went to bed a little uneasy and confused at the indirect lesson he had received and a good hour was employed by him in going over again in memory the embroideries the tapestries the bills of fare of the various banquets the architecture of the triumphal arches the arrangements for the illuminations and fireworks all the offspring of the clerk colbert's invention the result was the king passed in review before him everything that had taken place during the last eight days and decided that faults could be found in his fates but fouquet by his politeness his thoughtful consideration and his generosity had injured colbert more deeply than the latter by his artifice his ill-will and his persevering hatred had ever yet succeeded in hurting fouquet End of chapter forty seven